On October the 13th, 1977, Lufthansa Flight 181 was hijacked by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, also known as the PFLP. This hijacking would span five days from the 13th until the 18th of October 1977. And to tell this story, a little context is required. In the 1970s, left-wing terrorism was like, prevalent in Europe, and in West Germany there was a group called Red Army Faction. Red Army Faction was a Marxist, Leninist, anti-fascist militant group, angry at the failures of the West German government for its failings of denazification as former Nazis held position in government and local council. Several key members, including founders Andreas Bader and Gudrun Enslin, were imprisoned here at Stanheim Prison, which is in Stuttgart which at the time of 1977 was in West Germany. So they were imprisoned here. And in 1977, the activity escalated. So Bader and Enslin, um, they, they were imprisoned before 1977. They, they were imprisoned for a few years at this point. But in 1977, the activity had escalated in what would be a national crisis known as the German Autumn. On September the 5th, they kidnapped uh, the president of the German Employers Association, Hans Martin Schleyer, who was also a former officer of the SS. So the, he made a pretty good target for the Red Army faction because he was important, he was influential, and he was a former Nazi. He d the group d held him to ransom and demanded that Red Army Faction prisoners were released. This lasted a month and a week, so five weeks, until the PFLP decided to escalate things. The PFLP and the Red Army Faction, they shared the same ideology, they were allies, and Lufthansa was targeted as it was the German flag carrier. So they decided to hijack Lufthansa Flight 181. It left here, Palma Airport, it left Palma de Mallorca, bound for Frankfurt in West Germany, but it was hijacked around 30 minutes into the flight just as it was flying over Marseille. So I presume round about here in this circle before it gets to Marseille in the south of France, that's when the hijacking took place, 30 minutes into the flight. It was hijacked by four hijackers led by Sohair Youssef Akake, who went by the alias of Mahmoud, uh, he removed co-pilot Jürgen Weiter, leaving himself and Captain Jürgen Schumann in the cockpit. So he removed the co-pilot and the three other hijackers out in the fuselage of the of the aircraft with the other passengers. May I also add that there was 86 passengers on board and five crew members. Uh, the four terrorists were included. And those 86 passengers, so there was, 80, there was 82 passengers and five crew, including the co-pilot and pilot. Mahmoud wanted to go to Lanarka in Cyprus, but was told that they had to go to Roma or Rome because of insufficient fuel. They only had enough fuel to get them to Frankfurt, so if they were going to divert, they couldn't make it all the way to Cyprus and they had to go here to Roma Airport. Uh, for refueling and when they landed here which was roughly about 3.45 p.m. they made their demands of releasing 11 Red Army Faction prisoners along with two Palestinians that was held in Turkey and 15 million US dollars. The German interior minister which I, that, I believe what I'm about to explain was a pretty immediate reaction to what was going on um, but he, the, it was the German interior minister, he contacted the Italian interior minister and asked to shoot the aircraft's tyres to prevent it from taking off. The Italians, uh, they wanted nothing to do with this. Um, they didn't want to get involved 
they refueled it with 11 tonnes of fuel and made it depart at 5.45pm. It was only on the ground for two hours. And I believe that decision saved a lot of lives. If they shot those aircraft tyres, people could have died. It then made its way to Lanarka in Cyprus, landing here at 8.28pm. And about an hour into landing here, a representative of the Palestinian Libera Liberation Organization, also known as the PLO, a similar type of group to the PFLP, he tried to persuade Mahmoud to release the hostages, which only angered him. Um, he, he thought they'd be on the same side, but that only angered him. He got the plane refueled and they left. He wanted to go to Beirut in Lebanon, and two of the terrorists were Lebanese, two of them were from Palestine. He wanted to go to Beirut in Lebanon, but this was gaining attention pretty worldwide, especially in aviation. And so a lot of airports and airfields, they closed to this flight. So they followed this flight path here, and they followed it along to Beirut who said, you're not landing here, you're closed, to Damascus, who then said, yep, you're closed, you're not landing here. They went all across the desert to Baghdad, didn't let them in either. And then they went down to Kuwait, who told them the exact same thing, you're not getting in. So they then flew to Bahrain, down here, little island state, Bahrain, and they said the same thing, you're not getting in, but by this point, I believe it was actually, it wasn't even, they didn't even make it to the airport, it wasn't air traffic that told them, it was a passing Qantas airliner that told them, yeah, there's no point in trying, they're close to you, but with insufficient fuel, um, the pilot, Schumann, he, he pleaded with air traffic, like, I, I need to land here. And they were suddenly given a landing frequency, and once it landed here at Bahrain, they were surrounded by armed troops. But Mahmoud radioed air traffic and said if they if they don't fall back, that he would shoot the co-pilot, holding a pistol to the co-pilot's head, and initiating a countdown of five minutes, I believe. Um, the the armed troops fell back. The aircraft was then refuelled, and it would it would take off from Bahrain for Dubai at around about 3:24 a.m. So this was now the 14th of October into the second day. D Dubai also initially denied entry, and the runway was blocked with jeeps and trucks and fire engines to stop it from landing. But they were running low on fuel again and Schumann saying he was going to land anyway, whether the vehicles were, were removed or not. So the vehicles got out of the runway and they landed. The aircraft was stuck in Dubai for two days and during this time Schumann was able to communicate with air traffic control that there were two male hijackers and two female hijackers on board by dropping different types of cigarettes out the window. Dubai's Minister of Defence, though, he didn't keep it quiet and he, he spoke about this to, like, in interviews and Mahmoud obviously learnt about this and threatened his life, so Schumann was in his bad books a little bit. Dubai Airport is, like, big and I'm not sure where, because I assume I want to go back to... Okay, so this was... This is 1985, I've, went, I've put it back to. Hopefully we get a good image. Because I kind of want to see, because when they were in Dubai, they, they were stuck there for two days. And the German Special Forces, I don't think this is working, the German Special Forces were considering doing the rescue attempt there. And they were 
but instead of doing the rescue attempt they were then they conducted dry runs and they practiced like combat exercises on an adjacent airstrip so i was trying to see um if it would show imagery from 1985 because they weren't detected at all for the 40 they, they got about 45 hours worth of practicing and dry runs and just before they were they, they were going to go and rescue them that's when Mahmoud got the aircraft to get refueled got the clear and took off um, because he, he lost a bit of patience and he was starting to threaten passengers lives if the aircraft wasn't refueled so he got it refueled and they took off from Dubai before before the German Special Forces got to, to, to do their rescue attempt. But that two days allowed for them to kind of know what they were going to do when they got the next opportunity, which wouldn't be long. So it, it flew from Dubai. It took off two days later. And it went to Yemen. It didn't want to go to Yemen. As you see, I've drew, I've drew out another flight path. I drew out another flight path. It wanted to go to here. I've lost it. It wanted to go up here to Massiva Island, but denied entry. And then it wanted to go to Salalah, but again, denied entry. And then it went to here, Aden and South Yemen. Again, Aden or Aden also denied them entry. But if I zoom in on Aden, Air Aden Airport, they have two runways. Oh well, they have one main runway and then they've got like tarmac here. Like a taxiway almost. That they could have landed on and it, it, it was closed to them and it had again there was tanks there was trucks there was fire engines on the runway to stop them landing but dangerously low on fuel they actually landed here on the sand in between the both sets of tarmac and due to its rough landing like it, it didn't land on tarmac that they, they were afraid that the aircraft was damaged that it couldn't take off again Mahmoud allowed Schumann to go and check the aircraft condition and Schumann did not immediately return to the plane. Like He was only meant to go around and inspect the plane, make sure nothing was hanging off, make sure nothing was on fire, but he didn't immediately return and no one actually knows how long he was away for. But like Mahmoud went out, went, would like hang out the door and he would shout on him and he wasn't there. It was unclear how long he was away, but many speculate he was away asking ground crew to prevent the plane from taking off again and to not, like, fall into the hijacker's demands. Consequently, though, on his return to the aircraft when he did get back, Mahmoud took him in front of all the hostages and shot him point blank in the head without ever giving him a chance to explain himself. So no one actually knows what he was away doing. Mahmoud didn't allow him to explain himself. The plane was then refuelled and at two minutes past two in the morning on the 18th now, so yeah, it took off from Dubai on the 17th and this is now the 18th. It wasn't the 18th, it was the 17th. It took off at two minutes past two from Aden Airport and it went to Mogadishu all the way in Somalia. Co-pilot Viator, I imagine under extreme stress after seeing his captain getting shot in the head and knowing that these hijackers mean what they're doing and having an aircraft that just that is hanging on by dear life, he managed to get to Mogadishu Airport landing there at 6.34 in the morning. And they landed there again unannounced because they knew they'd get well, they did get refused, so they just landed there unannounced. It's a pretty big runway, though, so I'd imagine they landed without much stress. But, again, the, the aircraft was, like, hanging on by dear life. And Mahmoud was actually pleased with Viator. 
um, that he was able to land there with no hassle and he was told that he could go, he was away, save yourself. But he decided to remain with the passenger and his crew. So he stayed in the fuselage. He, he, the only reason that Mahmoud told Vieta that he could go is because that plane wasn't going anywhere anymore. That plane was retired. It was it was scrap at this point because it couldn't fly anymore. Um, but Vieta stayed and it parked in front of... Hold on there. It parked in front of the terminal building, which I presume is this building here. Hold on. Can I... I was going to see if I could check, but we are in Somalia. <laughs> but I, I do presume this is the terminal building. So I, I, let's say it parked here. And then troops, armed troops, Somali troops surrounded the plane. Schumann's body was then just tossed from the from the fuselage, tossed onto the tarmac in front of the troops, and the hijackers set a 1600 hours deadline for the release of the prisoners, or that they would destroy the aircraft. And by destroy, I do imagine setting it on fire as they started dousing passengers and alcohol that they had um, in the cabin in preparation. So if, if they were pouring alcohol over the passengers, I could only imagine that they were planning to set the aircraft on fire. So this was at half six in the morning and they set a deadline of 1600. Um, so that's, what, nine and a half hours deadline. Germany agreed, but like I say agreed in like inverted commas, but the, the prisoners that they were going to release, the Red Army Faction prisoners, their transfer to Somalia would take much longer. So the hijackers then did, like postponed their, or delayed their deadline until 02.30 on the 18th. So this gave West Germany some time. The German special forces, with what, they're, what they were preparing in Dubai, this is where they could go and carry it out. They made their way to Mogadishu. They landed there at about 8 p.m. And they landed, again, the runway is big. So they, they landed, let's say that the aircraft was parked there. They could they, they landed without detection and they had all the lights off, but they could land, on, land here without being detected. And they got all their stuff unloaded um, and finalising the assault which was due to begin at 0200, uh, 2 in the morning, uh, while Mahmoud was given like extensive fictional, he was given extensive fictional updates on like relief, the released, again, in inverted commas, Red Army Faction prisoners. So they, they built this believable story for Mahmoud to go along with the plan. And just after about 2 o'clock, let me spin this again, just after 2 a.m., Somali troops then set a fire about 60 metres away, so let's say roughly here as a diversion tactic because when they set the fire up all the hijackers went to the cockpit to see what was going on and that allowed the German commandos to quietly climb ladders that they set up outside opening the emergency doors. One was at the forward door and two was at the doors on the wings. And they stormed the aircraft all at the same time, shouting for everyone to get on the ground. And they shot all four terrorists, killing three and capturing one. One commando and three passengers and a flight attendant were also injured. But it only took them five minutes. At 12 minutes past two, five minutes after commencing the assault, the aircraft was evacuated and the operation was deemed a success. And success it was because all hostages were rescued and they were flew here all the way back home in West Germany to Cologne. Not even to Frankfurt, <laughs> where they were initially wanting to go. They they get took to Cologne, uh, Bonn Airport, five days after they were scheduled to get back into West Germany. But following the successful rescue of the hostages, Red Army Faction members, including Bader, Insulin and Rasp, 
in their prisons heard of the news and f all three of them were found dead in their cells, apparently from suicide. Um, but it is believed it was from suicide, but there is conspiracies. Uh, because another member, Armgard Muller, uh, she survived her suicide attempt. So, due to the fact that she survived what was an attempt, it is believed that the other three um, it was a uh, suicide. Also, as well, Hans Martin Schleyer, the guy that was kidnapped, he was murdered and his body was dumped uh, once he even of the deaths of the prisoners here at Stamheim Prison. They then contacted a French newspaper to announce his death and whereabouts. So, a lot of people died in that rescue attempt, but that is the story of Lufthansa Flight 181. 